All right, we're going to begin our program for tonight. Um, thank you for making your journey all the way out here to Hudson Yards. For those of you who took the 7 in, it was a new experience for you, wasn't it? It was kind of, you came out of the station, if you're not a frequent traveler of the 7, it's kind of, uh, where am I? Uh, yes, you, you're still in Manhattan, and uh, we're, we're glad that we were able to find this space. It is a beautiful space for us to kick off this year. And if you're a first time um, attender of a CFW event, we really want to welcome you. Uh, CFW is a part of Redeemer Presbyterian Church, and our mission is really to explore this intersection between faith and work. And we want to make clear to everyone that it's not a matter of uh, how, uh, if you integrate your faith and work, but really how you do it and which faith do you bring into it. And our, uh, our vantage point is that when the gospel comes to bear at every aspect of your work, you will see a fullness in the work that you do that is a witness to the reality of the love of God and the resurrected Christ. That's kind of the conviction that drives what we do. And we have a myriad of program, programming throughout the year. And what you're at tonight is one of our monthly large group gathering events. And so we want to welcome you. And this year is really, and this night, is really kicking off this year's theme, uh, which we've entitled The Soul of Work. And part of this idea is uh, understanding and trying to explore a new way of thinking about work. And my hope for tonight is that you will leave with a sense that my vision of work is way too small. And I want to present a proposition to you that the problem with our work is not that we expect too much from it, but actually that we expect too little from it. I'm evolving a C.S. Lewis phrase there, but I think by the end of tonight, I hope that what you're presented with is this sense that I really don't know what work is. And when we come to know what God has intended in creation as well as redeemed through Christ, our hope and our, our vision for work really needs to expand. And we think this idea of the soul of work really kind of encapsulates this uh, enlarging vision of what work is intended to be. And let me just, um, to kind of at least begin this conversation, I want to ask you a question. When was the last time you came home from work and you felt like, my work just engages every part of my being. I love my work. <laughs> okay. Well, I think the response says it all there. Um, it, it's, it's a little bit weird that, uh, you know, according to Gallup, over around 70% of Americans are disengaged at work. Right, think about it. The thing that most people spend most of their waking hours doing, people are disengaged. Meaning for whatever reasons they don't, when they go to work, it's almost like they leave their soul behind. And they, they're just there doing their thing day in and day out. And unfortunately, I think that resonates with, I think, 70% of you, if the statistic is right, of those of you who are in this room. That for whatever reasons, work has this kind of deadening effect on you. And let me just give at least, when I've looked online to see what are the reasons why people are disengaged from work. Here are a few just to kind of help you think about uh, why you might feel this disengagement. One is the amount of stress and isolation at work, uh, the absence of a manager or a boss, uh, no training, no real raise potential, <laughs> um, not a lot of non-financial incentives, a lack of respect, a lack of communication, annoying coworkers. Uh, that one seems to kind of <laughs> ring the bell with a lot of you. Uh, monotony, too many restrictions. And as you hear these things, yeah, these are, I think, helpful reasons why work is a bit less alluring for us. But at the same time, I don't think any of them really captures the heart of why work feels uh, very dissatisfying. And the way I wanted to start us off is by just thinking a little bit of when, when the gospel comes to us, it comes to us not only at a personal level, but because Christ died from the cross in a historic way. This faith is not just a private, personal, subjective faith, but it's one that's rooted in a historical reality that's uh, concurrent with our own, meaning the resurrection of Christ changes everything. It's not just a personal, subjective transformation. And when you think about that reality, how has the reality of the gospel changed the way that you approach work 
If it, indeed it is true that the gospel changes everything, then it has to dramatically change work. And it's not just a simple tweaking of your work, not just like, oh, I have a healthier perspective on my work, but there is a fundamental difference in the way that the gospel transforms work in the same way that you might describe your conversion experience not as a, a little bit sh of a shift in your personality, but a radical transition from an old to a new person. And so that dynamic, that gospel dynamic of making something that was once dead into something that is fully alive and flourishing is the same dynamic that we need to begin to apply to our workplaces. And that's why I say the problem with work is not that we expect too much, but that we expect too little. We don't have a vision for what work, what work was meant to be, and so we find ourselves trying to make work the best that we think it can be when, in fact, the gospel has released a power and a dynamic to transform work in a way that is radical the way that the world will look upon this and say, where did you get this conception of work from? I have never heard this. And so my hope for this year and tonight as we think about this theme further is that it's not so much about 12 steps to take for a, a fulfilled work life, as much as to plant the seed in all of our hearts and our minds that will over the course of our lives really germinate and bear fruit so that we begin to distinctively work out of this larger vision of what the gospel can do to transform our work. And with that end, I want to begin tonight with a clip uh, from a documentary that uh, has won several awards. Um, many of you probably have seen it. Uh, the clip is from Jiro Dreams of Sushi. So um, let me go ahead and uh, let me, uh, before you watch it, it's just a five minute clip, but um, I want to, as you watch it, I want you to think about um, Jiro's, he's the kind of the head uh, chef here, his vision of work his approach to work, and how that compares with your own. Yeah, how many of you want sushi now? <laughs> <laughs> when you watch uh, this short clip, I think, you know, what you see here flows throughout the whole documentary, and it, it is this, this profound sense that there's something about his relationship with his work that you would say is, is almost spiritual in nature because it's, it's much more than kind of a very flat understanding. I go to work, I do what they tell me to do, or I do what's expected, and I get paid for it. That there's a depth and a mystery to his work uh, that has connected with his own being, how he's built. And how many of us can say there's never been a day in our life where uh, we did not, or we hated going to work? You know, I think it's more like how many days how many good days outweigh the number of bad days? And that for us is like, if, if those good days outweigh the bad ones, you're doing pretty well here in New York. And yet that is such, is that the vision that we ought to have? Is that the vision that should propel us for the thing that we spend most of our waking hours from here to when, how many decades are before us, before we are at a point where even if we would like to work, we can't? What we are in desperate need of is a vision to compel us to understand that the gospel that we proclaim and we say that it changes everything has to expand so that the thing that we spend most of our waking hours doing, that is now part of the equation. That's my part of God's calling upon my life to help people see the fullness and the richness of who God is through perhaps the, every, the very mundane work that I do day in and day out. And with that end, I think this ideal, again, uh, of the soul of work is really helpful in trying to capture, uh, at least from a biblical and theological perspective, what it is for us to bring our soul to work. And, and I want to talk about three things here tonight. One, uh, the meaning of the soul. Uh, secondly, the contraction of the soul. And thirdly, um, the enlivening of the soul. So those three things of the meaning, the contraction, and the enlivening. And so the first thing here, you know, what do, what do I mean by the soul? And the very language of the soul evokes something of depth. You know, to say something is soulful uh, immediately connotes that there is something almost ineffable, but something that is deep, right? When something cannot be described, but certainly has the, the characteristic of a depth and a nuance, we say that is something, something soulful. And Another way of saying that is, is when we talk about the language of the soul, we know that there is more than just physical matter. It, it, it kind of grates against the positivism of our larger culture, meaning the materialism, uh, the modernism of our prevailing culture, to speak of the language of the soul pushes back against the prevailing thoughts of what exists in our world today. 
And so immediately when you conjure the language of the soul, you're admitting to the reality that something deeper exists than just atoms and molecules. And in some ways, it, it communicates at some level that we are amphibious creatures, that we are meant to exist in the world of the material and the material. That amphibians, for those of you who have forgotten these, you know, like frogs or amphibians, they start off in water, they have gills, they breathe underwater, but as they mature, they go to dry land, and if they go back to the water, they wouldn't survive because now they have lungs. They need both environments in order to thrive. And in the same way, as human beings created in the image of God, a world that is infused with his own character and being, we likewise, when we don't inhabit both of those spaces, we begin to die and shrivel. There's a deadening of our souls. And I dare say a lot of us can really, if we don't use this language, can relate to this idea that I feel like a part of me is really dead or dying slowly. And the soul resists, this language of the soul resists against the reductionistic tendencies of our culture today. Uh, it, it pushes back and presents a level of mystery. And, and in order to explain that a little bit, I want to um, disavow, I think, a lot of popular connections with this language of the soul. And that's often been uh, the platonic understanding of the soul was really a separation between the soul and the body. And that the body was really the prison house of the soul. That what was eternal and lasting and important was the invisible, immaterial soul. And the body is in some ways just the thing that we need for the soul to experience this world. And inversions of platonic thought that you would in this life in some ways have this reincarnation. If you were a good person, your soul would come back in the life form of a, a higher being. And that the greatest point of release would be for the soul to escape the body, the material. This was certainly a prevailing kind of philosophy during the time of Christ. And the biblical language of the soul is in stark contrast to that. When the Bible presents this language of body and soul, it's always inseparable. It's not so much describing two different realities as, as much as it's pointing to two vantage points of the same whole. That the soul and the body are inseparable. And that's why in the Christian notion of hell, hell is the separation of the body and the soul. That this is unnatural. This is what happens when things go wrong. The ultimate expression of wrongness in our world is this division, the separation between the material and the immaterial. And so, in the, in the biblical context, the language of the soul is something that brings uh, a real beauty and depth to the language of who we are as human beings. There's a mystery to it, and there's also this understanding that, again, we are more than just atoms and the material things that we see in one another. And when you look at Genesis 2-3, um, the language there when, in the creation of Adam and Eve is uh, the, the literal translation is God created a living soul and sometimes translated a living being. And that word appears in the very beginning of the text of Genesis in order to communicate who we are as people created in the image of God. Now let me be clear too, for those of you who were to do a, a more in-depth study of this word, soul, you would see a varied use of that word throughout the whole of Scripture. But when you look at all the various contexts and usages of this word, it's connoting something that cannot be contained or defined in an easy form. Part of the understanding of the soul is you can't reduce it to one simple definition because it's trying to describe life, vitality, the beings that we are. And so, so let me just begin with, with that concept that when we think of ourselves as people who have souls, we begin already from this very mysterious, um, non-reductionistic, expansive starting point. And then when we begin to apply some of the theology that perhaps, again, if you're here for the first time, uh, one of the things we often talk about is work is the expression of our identity. It's not the source of it. Right? We don't derive our identity, our worth, our value, our security from our work. Rather, it is the very expression of who we are. And so there is an intimate connection between who we are and what we do. And hence, there is this, the language of the soul of work. Not so much that work is a living entity that has an inherent soul in and of itself, but it's communicating the intimate relationship between who we are as people who have souls and what we do with our lives that should be the expression of who we are. In some ways, in the same way that when God created human beings in his image, our work also bears that quality. So that when you look at the sushi that Jiro makes, there is something qualitatively different from that and the sushi you would find in Dwayne Reed. <laughs> right? 
there's a soulfulness in that work. And we would say there is in that, and, and each piece of sushi like costs like $35, just to be clear. Um, and, and he's a th he has a three-star Michelin restaurant that's literally in a subway with like six seats. That's his restaurant. Um, but we can see in the difference, if I were to you know, both present and to taste Jiro sushi and Dwayne Reed sushi, what it means to be, have soulful work and non-soulful work. Work that is flattened to be efficient uh, and uh, productive and, and kind of the, the well, I guess Jiro probably makes a good amount of money too, but you know what I mean, that there's a flattening versus a real expansion there. And let me kind of go deeper that when you think about work being the expression of who we are, uh, there's also in the scriptures the sense that inherent in that work and in that depth is a depth and delight. A depth and delight. You see that in, in Proverbs 8 in this um, passage that is looking back on creation. And let me read you this text here. When he established the heavens, I was there. I meaning wisdom in this text. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the foundations of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limits. So he's talking about the literal edges of creation. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman. And I was daily his delight. Rejoicing before him, always rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. You see, in this picture of God as creator, you see him in the depths of what he creates, but also the delight that fills him in this creation. And so one way of describing qualitatively when soul enters into our work, that there is a depth in the work that we do that people can see, and again, I think that was evident even in the five-minute clip, but also a delight, a real sense that work is not a drudgery, but it is the opportunity for me to know myself and the wonder in which I've been made. And again, the comparison of work and our identity and the, the fusion of those things at some level, it's a bit like a lot of us, as, as, uh, for those of you who might have grown up in a church context, when you think about salvation, it's often been these, we need to save people from going to hell. But that's a bit, that vision of the, the gospel is a bit like, well, we need to save fish, but forget the ocean. <laughs> you, know, you have to save the ocean if you're going to save the fish, because that's what they were created to be in. And at some level, if God just saves us, but we are created to work because work is the expression of our being and our identity, of course God is interested in the soul of our work. He wants the work that we do to embody who we are because out of the fullness of our being comes a fullness of work. Just to drive this point a little bit clearer, I wanna, um, I've been reading a lot of Edwards over the summer and I know uh, Jonathan Edwards is not a theologian that's often connected with kind of work theology, but I found him to be one of the most insightful in thinking about faith and work and some of the theology that should really begin to shape uh, the way we think about our work. And let me read you this passage from, um, this was actually a biographer named uh, George Marsden. He wrote this kind of magisterial work on the life of Edwards, a big tome, and then he wrote a second smaller book, uh, which is not a summary of the tome, but uh, was another unique contribution, but much faster to read, and let me just read you uh, an excerpt from this quote, uh, this book, because I think it begins to broaden our uh, understanding of the world in which we live. Uh, and Marsden writes this, Edwards now saw that the universe was essentially personal, an emanation of the love and beauty of God, so that everything, even inanimate matter, was a personal communication from God. So in contrast to many contemporaries such as Benjamin Franklin, who saw Newton's laws as mo of motion as providing the model of understanding an essentially impersonal universe, Edward started with a personal and sovereign God who expressed himself even in the ever-changing relationships of every atom to each other. This dramatic insight would be the key to every other aspect of his thought. Like a mathematician who had discovered an elegant solution to an immense problem, Edwards was captivated by the beauty of this insight. He now found the doctrine of God's sovereignty, quote, a delightful conviction. In them, he was now, he, he was overwhelmed by a new sense, quite different from anything he had ever experienced before. 
This new sense was a sort of inward sweet delight in God and divine things. And such experiences which recurred throughout his life clearly were related to his intellectual breakthrough. Once he understood the grandeur, goodness, and glory of God in large enough terms, he began to have a life-changing emotional encounter with the beauty of God. These compelling experiences of beauty might come as they first once did simply from the meditating on scripture that spoke of God's greatness and glory, or they might well up while he contemplated the loveliness and beauty of Jesus Christ, or he might be overwhelmed by walking alone in the fields considering the works of creation, the sun, the moon, the trees, the flowers, or even thunder. And I would add to that, perhaps you might see the beauty of God in these profound, life-changing ways through the work that you do each day. That the scriptures begin to open up our eyes to see the reality of what we do day in and day out from a very different vantage point. Not from the perspective of what has been shaping our philosophical and cultural ethos, but through the words of what Christ has said, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. So, so that begins to help us understand a little bit about the meaning of the soul, the depth, the breadth of, in which when we begin to think about this concept, uh, a whole new world literally begins to open up to us. But then I want to talk about, well, if that's the case, why is that virtually no one sees this world that apparently exists? And, and I want to talk about how the soul has contracted. And there are three, um, three ways I think the soul has contracted, uh, two that are external and one that's internal. Um, And the two external ways, let me just start, and I want to go through this pretty briefly. Um, uh, one that is kind of philosophically driven and one that has been technologically driven. Uh, the philosophical kind of external um, influence has really been uh, you know, what we've been experiencing in the West for centuries now, the rise of modernity and this worldview that has essentially demythologized our world. The idea is now that we are modern people, enlightened to know that things like ghosts and demons and gods, they don't really exist anymore. And so we have to grow up now and create a worldview in which that's consistent with that conviction. We know that our past ancestors depended upon this spiritualized world in order to explain the things that they could not explain and in order to get some level of comfort in the mysteries of life that could easily overwhelm them. But now we have science and now we have neuroscience. And now we have a way of understanding this world where we really don't need and we need to outgrow God. And this, this kind of secularism, um, in some ways, the positives of that move uh, philosophically, philosophically gave human beings a tremendous amount of freedom because we were no longer culpable to anyone or accountable to anyone. Not even our families any, anymore, and especially if you're not accountable to God, then why do you have to be accountable to your parents or to your family? And so there was this aggressive individualism that began to spread very quickly and a, a very rugged kind of self-determinism as well that the benefits of the enlightenment and the modernity that ensued afterwards was this idea that I am the master of my own fate. But what philosopher Charles Taylor begins to outline in his book, Secular Age, is that there is in the result of that disenchantment, this ongoing, this uh, growing of what he calls a malaise of modernity. And to make these philosophical terms a bit more kind of um, tangible to us, I want to now turn to uh, the popular media to get a sense of what does he mean by the malaise of modernity? And I, I, with that, I want to um, share a quote from another interesting book called How to Survive the Apocalypse by uh, two friends of ours here at CFW. Um, and they wrote this book uh, looking at popular shows and trying to understand what is going on in our larger culture. And, and the quote is this, we once had the Cold War utopianism of Captain Kirk. And now we have J.J. Abrams' Star Trek Into the Darkness, with its none too metaphorical annihilation of logic and inversion of the Trek universe through the destruction of the planet Vulcan. We've gone from the idealistic psychohistory of Isaac Asimov to the fatalist siren call of the Cylons in Battlestar Galactica. We went from the sacrificial valor of hobbits to the purging of innocence in Westeros. If you know all those references, you watch a lot of shows, so good for you. Um, but when you look at other popular shows, like the you know, movies and shows like The Hunger Games, Her, Game of Thrones, House of Cards, 
you know, you name whatever's hot on Netflix or uh, on, on, on uh, one of those um, media outlets, all of them have this common theme of a dystopic vision of our world. That in the, in the desire to be the, our own masters, authenticity becomes a key for uh, what is meaningful and true. And when we look deep inside of ourselves and in the world, the thing that becomes the most resonating to be true is the brokenness that we find within and without. And you can only conclude that for us to find meaning is to come to terms with the reality of the brokenness of our world. And it is hard to watch sometimes, these shows. But at some level, we keep watching them, we binge watch, because for some reasons, it seems to resonate within us in a very deep way. And that's because philosophically, our larger culture has philosophically stripped away that sense of anything deeper than the material world that we inhabit. As much as we want to believe in things like the soul and the spiritual realm, they now have to be relegated to the, the realm of fiction and superheroes and zombies. That's where we're going to get our fix. But we, when we begin to try to import that into the world we inhabit, then it feels like we're a little bit off the deep end and you're no longer living in reality. So that's, that's number one, kind of philosophically. Number two, a lot shorter here, is the way that technology has made the speed of our lives so much faster, meaning it's so hard to find quiet moments in your day. Think about today. What was the longest stretch of quiet that you had where you had a sense of solitude? Now, for many of us, it's perhaps the walk to the subway. It's certainly not during the subway. But at best, it's almost like the only time we get, and the subway stops are typically not too far if you're living here in New York City, not that far from where you live, or ideally. Meaning that the speed of our external lives has created, again, this kind of neglect of our own souls because for the soul to grow, as we'll see, it needs a sense of solace and solitude. It needs an awareness of the interior life an acknowledgement that it exists in order for it to flourish and grow. But where do we find that when you're getting a, uh, an endless stream of emails as well as updates from various social media outlets? When is there ever an opportunity for our soul to begin to breathe? Abraham Kuyper said it well uh, at the beginning of uh, the 19th century when he said, our personal life as men and citizens subsists not in the comforts that surround us, nor in the body which serves as a link with the outward world, but in the spirit that internally actuates us. And in this inner consciousness, we are becoming more and more painfully aware how the hypertrophy of our external life results in a serious atrophy of the spiritual. It's a great phrase. The hypertrophy of our external life results in a serious atrophy of the spiritual, or I would say soul. So that's reason number two. Reason number three, why our souls are contracted, is internal to us. It's the nature of sin within us. The most succinct and most beautiful way to share this is with a quote. And I actually printed this because I think it's, uh, it's really worth um, just being able to um, let this sink in a bit. I've used this quote several times, but I think it captures so well uh, the impact of sin internally and the contraction of the soul that ensues. Before, and as God created him, he was exalted and noble and generous. But now he is debased and ignoble and selfish. Immediately upon the fall, the mind of man shrank from his primitive greatness and expandedness to an exceeding smallness and contractedness, and as in other respects, so especially in this. Before, his soul was under the government of that noble principle of divine love, whereby it was enlarged to the comprehension of all his fellow creatures and their welfare. And not only so, but it was not confined within such narrow limits as the bounds of the creation, but went forth in the exercise of holy love to the Creator and abroad upon the infinite ocean of good as was, and was, as it were, swallowed up by it and became one with it. But as soon as he had transgressed against God, these noble principles were immediately lost and all of this excellent enlargedness of man's soul was gone. And thenceforth he shrank, he himself shrank, as it were, into a small little space circumscribed and closely shut up within itself to the exclusion of all things else. 
Sin, like some powerful stringent, contracted his soul to the very small dimensions of selfishness. And God was forsaken, forsaken and fellow creatures forsaken, and man retired within himself and became totally governed by narrow and selfish principles and feelings. Self-love became absolute master of his soul, and the more noble and spiritual principles of his being took wings and flew away. It's so tragic, but so poetic. I think Edward encapsulates there so beautifully the intention of humanity and the enlargedness of our soul in the likeness of our creator, but how sin, because of our myopic selfishness, has contracted our soul so, so much so that we don't even know that it exists. And the result of this with respect to our work is what we often encounter day in and day out, that kind of numbing, deadening effect over time, that sense of, I need to find another job because I'm suffocating, I'm dying here. This is not me. I feel like I was definitely created for a lot more than what I'm experiencing now. And that is the impact of the contracted soul. That we have no vision to see the work behind it, in front of us, because all work is an expression of God's character at some level, and we lack the vision to see it. But then on top of that, it's being reinforced by the culture around us, that we pay you to do work. This dehumanization that happens, that strips us away of the higher calling that God has imbued in our work. And so the contraction of the soul is something that is devastating to our sense of work. And the more we begin to see the heights of the soul, the more depressed we could be become because we see all the more clearly the brokenness of the work that we're engaged in. But now here's the kicker. Here enters the gospel. That the work of Christ on the cross did not exclude the ocean in which we were saved into. That the work of Christ in making all things new extends to the very work that we're doing. So as he renews us, he renews us in such a way to give us eyes to see. That we would be people who live by faith and not by sight in God's creation and intention for us. And let me now continue with the, the rest of uh, the Edwards quote because here is the good news. Here is what we want to live in. Um, this is uh, by God, but God in his mercy, in mercy to his miserable man, entered on the work of redemption and by the glorious gospel of his son began the work of bringing the soul of man out of its confinement and contractedness and back again to these noble and divine principles by which it was animated and governed at first. And it is through the cross of Christ that he is doing this. For our union with Christ gives us participation in his nature. And so Christianity restores an excellent enlargement and an extensiveness and liberality to the soul and again possesses it with that divine love or charity that we read of in the text, whereby it again embraces its fellow creatures and is devoted to and swallowed up in the Creator. He doesn't talk explicitly about work here, but when you begin to apply the work of the gospel to say, when we begin to embrace, we, when we experience the embrace of the love of God and the expansiveness of that love in this world, that cannot help but to change the way you think about your work. And our, our world is so desperate for a new vision of work. A, a vision that's a little bit different from the past spiritualized versions of the world where there was, in, in, in essence, a demon behind every uh, work desk or workstation. But a, a vision that has been dominated by the grace and the mercy of God reflected in the work of Christ. The hope that work can be so much more than what it is now. That, that there would be in the call of every person who follows Christ a conviction a deep dissatisfaction with the present nature of work that recognizes that the change that the gospel brings is not a quick one in the same way that we experience in our individual transformation and change. It is one that is a lifelong process, but one that we can be assured that he who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. And that what else is going to drive and motivate us when the world around us communicates a, a, a narrative and a vision of work that is so dehumanizing? And so let me close with this, you know, the enlivening of the soul. When the soul, when the gospel begins to enliven our soul, there is a fullness that begins to emerge from who we are and what we do. 
Again, from the fullness of who we are, our being emerges a fullness in our work. And let me try to qualify a bit what I mean by kind of this fullness. Um, that when we consider the, the work of Christ, and you can go on to the next slide, we live in a world that has in some ways dichotomized uh, many aspects of existence. And you can see I'm, I'm operating at a pretty high level here. And this is really about trying to paint a different vision of work that we experience in our world this division between the material and the immaterial, meaning that when we think about the world in which we inhabit, the only things that are ultimately true and real are the things that are material and physical. But the gospel presents to us that there is an immaterial beyond the, beyond the material that is as real as the material and intimately connected with it. That there are spiritual realities to the work that we do and that we engage in every day. That when the soul begins to penetrate within us, the vision of our work becomes no longer just purely material, but we begin to see again the interaction, the integration between the material and the immaterial. And not only that, with respect to our world, that this next um, the dichotomy of the imminence and the transcendent, the imminent and transcendent, refers to our reality is not confined only by the material and immaterial of, immaterial of our world, but that the scriptures communicates the reality of a transcendent world, a world that is outside of our own purview. That in the imminence of our world, there can be a sense of living in a closed system of resources and time. Meaning when all that we see is this imminent world, there is a real box that we live in. And yet, we know that there is a God who is both imminent and transcendent, reminding us that there is something beyond the world that is connected to this world. That there is not a limited pie in which we are all fighting for resources and time, but all of a sudden when transcendence enters into our world, there is this opening that we can do things and think about things differently because transcendence is part of the imminent world that we live in. Thirdly, that as we think about these two realities, both in our world and outside of our world, uh, it begins to shape the orientation of our work, meaning that when we think about the reality of the transcendent, that there is in the soul a joining of our work uh, in this world with the work outside of our world to the transcendent, so that our work is not only self-oriented, but is also God-oriented. Meaning the purpose of our work, the telos, of our work is not only for our own benefit, meaning a sense of security, a sense of identity, a sense of worth, all these things we do at some level receive from our work. But along with that, there is also the additional orientation that our work is karam deo, in the face of God, that there's a Godwardness to our work, that our work not only benefits us as individuals, but is a reflection of the very glory of God in tangible ways. And along with that, then, the value of our work is both, is both instrumental and intrinsic. If we do not live in a closed world, but we live in a world that is both imminent and transcendent, uh, that's not merely self-oriented, but also God-oriented, there is both an instrumentality of our work, meaning our work produces certain effects and benefits in the world. But it's not merely the effects and the benefit of our work, but it's also the intrinsic value of the work we do itself meaning the ends do not justify the means, that the work that everyone does, whether, again, you're the, sweets, the street sweeper or you're the president of a nation, all that work has intrinsic value, again, because of all those other factors, the transcendence and the glory of God imbues it with meaning that apart from that enlargement, there would be, there would be no apparent intrinsic value in work. And lastly, as we engage in this kind of work, it requires both um, the, the employment of both our reason and our emotions working together as one, bringing in the unique capacities of both. Too often times, our work, in a sense, again, is very bifurcated. You either bring your reason or your emotion. You know, let's, in, in very uh, stereotypic terms, you, know, you have the, the world of the academy, and then you have the world of the arts. And yet again, in this vision of the soul of work, God calls the whole of our being to enter our work, which is, again, the union of both what our, our, our reason as well as our emotions bring into our work. And that's, I know that was a lot, but just again, to expand the categories by which we think about, what does it mean for the soul to enter our work? And I'm, I'm, tonight is really an introduction to the whole year, and I, I hope you leave with a sense of, I want more. Um, 
But the more that we will leave you with tonight, at least, we do want to give you something very practical. That when we look in the scriptures, too, the question of then, how do we begin to live in this enlivened soul? The paradox of the gospel is, in order for us to experience life, we have to go through death. Meaning this, that it's often the pain points of our lives that's the entry point for an enlarged soul. So the very reasons you hate work and you want to leave your job are the very things that God will use to enlarge your soul and help you see the fullness of your work. That's the wonder and the beauty of the gospel. He will take the things that are so broken and use it for your good and the good of others. And so we've created a, an exercise for all of you to engage in in these next 10 minutes. Not a lot of time, but again, to get, put your, dip your foot in the pool, in a matter of speaking, and understanding the way that God is able to bring the soul uh, into our work. And um, before I release you to this exercise, I just also want to say, um, pain and also prayer are the two ways of growing the soul. And when pain and prayer go hand in hand, it is a powerful combination. Pain without prayer is often just pain. And pain, uh, prayer without pain is often just a dead kind of, uh, uh, kind of a dead ritual. When you realize the pain, not only in our lives, but in the world around us, our prayers become that much more urgent to God. And in that urgency, we see the enlivening of our soul. So um, I'm not going to have time to go into the prayer aspect, but throughout the year, we will have three evenings that will focus on prayer. And so I want to just give you at least a heads up to that. That will happen in the winter dull month, uh, you know, December, January, and February. Uh, and we will go much deeper into the, the role of prayer and the deepening of our soul.